The last time I spoke about Black Clover, one of the things that I mentioned appreciating is just how personal most of the larger conflicts and systemic issues seem to feel. Nearly every main and side character gets their chance to shine in some form or another and I strongly believe that this is one of the narrative and thematic threads that helps maintain this pattern. The Magic Knights of the Clover Kingdom serve their home and all of its inhabitants, but also find themselves restricted and, in some cases, even victimized by the kingdom's status quo. I mean, Asta nearly gets straight up jumped for being a peasant with dreams of becoming the Wizard King. And all out chaos almost breaks out when Leopold, a royal, acknowledges said peasant as his rival shortly thereafter. Interestingly though, it's not enough for Tabata to just present these issues to us, he also puts his massive cast of characters in situations almost as if to ask, what are you going to do about it? What unique skills do you bring to the table to contribute to moving the needle, and how will you handle the roadblocks stopping you from doing so? Seemingly every single member of the Magic Knights has some form of utility or usefulness to benefit the whole, whether it be offensively or otherwise. As much as Asta trains, you get to learn really quickly that the threats he and the knights face can't be handled by a single person alone. Everyone typically continues to try to do their best to improve themselves, moving towards greater and greater levels of mastery over their magic to be more useful to the Clover Kingdom. And then we have this guy. Ah yes, the oblivious overconfident buffoon. A classic staple of the shonen genre, I assure you, and much like Mr. Satan before him, the fake it till you make it king of Black Clover never fails to disappoint time and time again throughout this series. So, what if I told you that Seke Bronzaza, Jesus Christ, I can't believe I'm about to say this, has one of the most profound character arcs in this series, highlighting this very idea of self-improvement for the sake of collective success. I'm really excited for this final act of the Spade War to be animated because if you think what we've seen so far has been hype, the rest of this war elevates things to an entirely different stratosphere of insanity. And it's within this insanity that I realized that Seke wasn't just some throwaway character, but actually serves an interesting narrative purpose that Tabata seems to have been building towards for the majority of the manga. So before we end there, let's start here. Clover Kingdom's Magic Knight Entrance Exam. This is where we get to meet the failure in chief himself for the very first time, and in this moment, we actually get the entirety of his character summed up pretty well. He's a nobody from nowhere who relies on using others that he perceives as lower than himself to stand out and seem capable and important. Like I mentioned, we learn this about him right away as he sticks close to Asta in order to make his feats of magic seem all the more impressive looking in comparison once he learns that Asta has no magic at all. Of course, this obviously and hilariously comes back to bite him in the end because, well, this is the protagonist we're talking about here, but on a deeper level, this also highlights Seke's vanity and superficiality since he is absolutely the judge of book by its cover type. After Asta throws him in the blender, we see him again here and there for comic relief mostly, but interestingly, we also get to see him during a few key moments of the plot as well. The first of these moments comes during the fight against Veto in the underwater temple. He gets a front row seat to the curb stomping this boy single-handedly gives to a group of 50 magic knights simultaneously. Despite the fact that he spends this entire time cowering behind a rock, this is actually a huge moment for him as well as the Black Bulls, considering how powerful Veto is himself. He's frequently compared to a squad captain in terms of his strength, and throwing him at the Black Bulls, especially Asta and Noel, who just joined at the same time as Seke, seems kind of disproportional to their current experience and skill level. This is easily one of the series' best and most iconic Surpass Your Limits moments, which has its own significance that I'll circle around back on a bit later. After this, we don't really see much of the loser extraordinaire for the next few arcs outside of him hating on the squad and acting the fool for some laughs. That is, until somehow he gets chosen to compete in the Royal Knight Selection Exam? Surprisingly enough, he actually manages to make it pretty far. Although this might have something to do with the fact that he's placed on a team with the outrageously overpowered Vice Captain of the Golden Dawn, Lagris. He does, however, serve as the perfect partner since all he does is follow Lagris' orders. He doesn't think for himself, he just kind of falls in line as a good commoner should, follows his orders, and things go pretty well for him. That is, of course, until they don't. His plan for the entire tournament 
revolves around letting Langris do all of the heavy lifting, so it's pretty obvious why things turn out the way that they do. Now, unfortunately, I do regret to inform you that despite his all-star worthy performance, Seke is not chosen to join the Brawl Knights on their raid against the Eye of the Midnight Sun. Instead, we see him next during the elf invasion back in the Clover Kingdom, where he accidentally runs into the king himself. He nearly manages to get his first real win in the series here by using his defense magic to protect the king from oncoming attacks. Of course, this is until he snatches the feet out of the jaws of victory by running out of magic at the last possible moment, leaving them both open to attack from some opportunistic assassins. Fortunately for the both of them, someone competent shows up to save the day. That being said, Seke's perceived heroism does end up earning him some favor with the king, as well as a spot on the team planning on raiding the Spade Kingdom in the next six months. Now, I know I already said this in the beginning, but the Spade War from this point onwards is nothing short of a roller coaster ride from start to finish. Everyone's individual training, hard work, and growth is put to their utmost limits as everyone desperately fights for the sake of humanity against the devil threat. Enter Lucifero. Lucifero. Lucifer. Satan. Look, whether or not you think this was a wasted or underwhelming villain, his strength was a completely different story. He absolutely wrecks everyone, Asta included, repeatedly. Meanwhile, Seke can be seen cowering in fear, trying his best to go unnoticed. Now, honestly, this is what I typically come to expect from a character like this in a show like Black Clover. However, Tabata makes the bold choice to actually bring him into the conflict rather than leave him as a distant observer. To explain what I mean, right in the middle of the battle, Yuno manages to bring a wounded Asta as well as Mimosa over to where Seke is hiding to provide some temporary shelter as they catch their breath and regroup. The situation on the battlefield is beginning to look pretty grim. The majority of the Clover Kingdom's heaviest hitters are all down for the count and their secret weapon is clinging on for dear life. So, Seke does what any self-respecting soldier would do in a moment like this, tries to get Mimosa to commit desertion with him. Huh? Huh? Not only does he clearly fail to read the room here pertaining to what's on the line, like for real, where are you gonna run? As the cherry on top, he also assumes that a pretty face like Mimosa's shouldn't be on the battlefield and tries to rope her into his cowardice with all of his typical fake bravado as well. Once he's realized that he's failed the wrist check and she won't even look at him, reality finally begins to set in. He begins to reflect back on his life and curses Asta for how things have turned out for him since their first encounter. You can see him begin to doubt himself, however, once he remembers how Asta encouraged him at the beginning of the Royal Knight selection. Seke snaps back to reality once Mimosa's magic begins to fade and her healing spell breaks before Asta can recover enough to safely return to the battle. Regardless, Asta immediately stands up, sword in hand, ready to get back into the thick of it. Unable to hear Mimosa's words anymore, he keeps walking towards the battlefield as if driven purely by instinct alone. Confused by Asta's determination, Seke tries to discourage him from rejoining the fight until it finally hits him. This is the first opportunity that we as the audience get to take a look deeply into his character, but we also get the impression that this is a first for Seke as well. He's seen having multiple flashbacks all throughout this chapter, but they're spliced in along with current events as they happen in real time. This kind of paneling allows for the momentum to keep moving along with the pace that Tabata has set up for this arc, while simultaneously giving the emotional payoff that's coming some additional fuel. This chapter is titled Excuses, and it starts off with Seke doing just that, making excuses and blaming others for his circumstances. In fact, it's this exact habit of relying on excuses that ultimately makes him face his own shortcomings. Despite baiting both Mimosa and Asta into copping out, not only do neither of them fall for it, they both completely ignore him. While everyone is looking for some way to contribute, Seke is the only one here trying to find a way out of it. And it's exactly this realization that breaks him. This last line of his is amazing to me because it nails in the point that everyone has potential. When the peasant with no magic can rise to incomprehensible heights among the magic knights, what excuse could you possibly come up with? 
Both he and Asta witnessed Veto's strength firsthand and therefore had more insight than most others as to how strong the enemy's upper tiers were. But he's never seen using any of this information to benefit himself or his squad. He knew for an entire six month period that he was going to be invading a neighboring kingdom with even stronger enemies and yet he's never once seen training or even in direct combat. He's basically there for all of the clout and none of the action. That being said, this chapter is also as powerful as it is because of how painfully regretful he becomes once he can no longer hide from the truth. Now that we're officially in the final arc of this series, I'm beginning to wonder if this is the last that we'll ever see of Seke Bronzaza, or if he'll get a chance to redeem himself at some point. After all, as we all know, being weak is nothing to be ashamed of. Remaining weak is peace.